Hello and welcome. In our first video on geometry, we began our investigation into angles. And in our second previous video, uh, we began our exploration into circles. In this, our third video on geometry, we're going to expand our knowledge in both areas, angles and circles. We're going to improve our skills with regards to uh, locating and quantifying different geometries within a circle. And really in the process, we're going to arrive at a new uh, scale for measuring and quantifying angles. It's a lot to get done in a short amount of time. So let's first of all take some time for ourselves. This is a time for you to empty yourself of all of the things that would get in the way and distract you from the time that we're going to be spending together here. All the regrets of the past, all the worries of the future, all the anxieties and judgments of the present, just empty those things away so that we can spend some optimal time together. Take some time for that. Welcome back. Let's begin with some warm-up problems that are intended to draw upon your knowledge from the previous video on geometry and circles. In this case, I want you to find the circumference to the nearest tenth of a meter of a circle that has a diameter of 1.3 meters. Think about the formulas that we use in order to be able to find the circumference of the circle. Pick the appropriate one and fill it in accordingly. Take some time for that. Welcome back. Well, I didn't specify what particular approximation for pi that you should use, and so if your answer looks a little bit different than mine, um, that's fine. But I'm guessing that rounded off to the nearest tenth, uh, you probably shouldn't have something that's any different than 4.1 meters, really. Um, I multiplied pi times d, that's our formula, our best formula for uh, finding the circumference of, the cir of this circle here. So pi times 1.3 meters is in fact 4.1 meters. Here's another one. For this particular circle, I want you to find, once again, the circumference of the circle rounding to the nearest hundredth of a foot. And in this case, the radius, they're not giving you the diameter, but we are giving you the radius, and it's one foot nine inches. Take some time for that.
Welcome back. Well, probably the biggest challenge with this problem was dealing with multiple units, one foot nine inches. And because they uh, were specifically asking for uh, the answer to come back to the nearest hundredth of a foot, tells us that, or ultimately at least, should we we should provide an answer in feet. And so um, we have our equation here, our formula for the circumference of the circle. Uh, it's 2 pi r since we're using the radius here. So we have 2 pi times 1 foot 9 inches. And just to stay within feet and not really sojourn into the area of, of inches too much, um, let's convert 9 inches into feet. Well, 9 inches in, is 9 twelfths of a foot. 9 twelfths can be simplified to 3 fourths. So this is actually 1 and 3 fourths feet multiplied by 2 pi. You can see that the result that we get there is 11.00 feet. And again, you might have used a different approximation for pi. Perhaps you used 3.14. Perhaps you used the pi button on your calculator. Maybe you used 22 sevenths. Either way, you should have gotten something that was pretty close to the answer that's provided here. If it's off by a hundredth, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, so keep that in mind. In addition to taking a look at circumference of a circle last time, we also took a look at the area of a circle. And I'd like for us to review that as well. Let's find the area of this circle, whose radius is 8.5 meters, round to the nearest tenth of a square meter. Take some time for that. Welcome back. Well, we used our uh, somewhat popularly familiar formula here of pi r squared in order to find the area of a circle. In this case, r is given to us as 8.5 meters, so we make sure that you square that first on your calculator. Remember, order of operations, exponents are before multiplication, so first on your calculator you want to hit 8.5. Maybe you have a squared button on your calculator that you can hit. If not, then just say 8.5 multiplied by 8.5 and then hit equals, it's the same thing. And then we can multiply it by pi, and we should get an answer there. When rounded to the nearest tenth of a square meter, that should be 227.0 square meters. Remember, we're using square meters, square units, when we're describing uh, quantities of area. Let's also take a look at this one here. Let's find the area of the top of a circular tank with a diameter of 12 feet 8 inches, round to the nearest hundredth of a square foot. So we are looking down at a circular tank. I should say really it's a cylindrical tank, so um, it's almost like it's the uh, maybe one of those oil uh, storage containers that's very, very large that we use for our oil, our national oil reserves. Or perhaps it's like a Pringles can in which you're uh, looking down on uh, from the top in which it really looks like a circle from the top, doesn't it? Um, either way, you're finding the area of the top of this circular tank, and we're giving you the diameter there of 12 feet 8 inches. Once again, we're going to round to the nearest hundredth of a square foot. Take some time for that.
Welcome back. Well, this posed a dual challenge here for you. Not only did we have the uh, 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 pre-existing challenge of converting from inches into feet, so instead of six feet, four inches, we were dealing with six and a third feet, converting those four inches into feet. But as I'm indicating here as well, we had to remember that in order for us to calculate the area of a, of a circle, we need the radius, not the diameter. And the way that we get the radius from the diameter is to simply cut it in half. So 12 feet 8 inches became 6 feet 4 inches. We then transitioned that from 6 feet 4 inches to 6 and a third feet, or as an improper fraction, that's simply 19 thirds feet. We can then just plug it into our formula here. A is equal to pi r squared, and so we're squaring that radius and then multiplying it by pi for an answer of 126.01 square feet. Something else that we talked about last time was how you can define uh, and quantify geometries for larger, com more complex type of shapes by breaking it down to more simplistic uh, constituent shapes. In other words, we've got a donut here in which we want to be able to um, find the area of that. Well, it's actually a wheel, not a donut. But as you can see, it's got a large circle around the uh, around the edge and then in the center it's got a hole that's also a circle and so the way that we would find the um, uh, the area of this wheel is perhaps by taking the area of the larger circle and subtracting out the center so take some time to do that that can practice those skills for you as well Welcome back. Now, if these results look in any way unfamiliar or strange to you, perhaps it's because uh, you forgot that, again, we have to divide those diameters of those circles in half in order to get a radius, and it's the radius that we use in order to calculate those areas. So for the big circle, it's not 15 inches that we're plucking in for a radius, it's 7.5 inches that we're plugging in for that radius. And similarly, for the hole, it's not 3 inches that we're plugging in for the radius, it's 1.5 inches that we're plugging in for the radius. In both cases, we can use the same formula, and for the big circle, we get 176.7 square inches. For the smaller circle, we get 7.1 square inches. How do we find the area of the ring? Subtract the small one from the large one. 176.7 minus 7.1 is 169.6 square inches. So once again, this is a good review of how you can use uh, more simplistic constituent shapes in order to
quantify and define the geometries of more complex shapes. It's a divide and conquer uh, approach that we practiced a little bit last, last, last time and also uh, this time as well. Now this next example here involves something called a bandsaw. Uh, and if you've never worked with a, a bandsaw before, it's much like uh, the blade that would be on a chainsaw and that it exists on a, a kind of chain that goes around and around uh, both of those pulleys that you see there. It's almost like a bicycle chain in which there's a chain that goes around one gear and goes around the other one and it revolves in that kind of a fashion except that instead of just a chain, these are chains that have uh, cutting edges on them in order to um, slice through things. So, just how long does this saw blade have to be? Well, we've got some uh, geometry geometric measurements here of this whole thing. And we know that the diameter of those two gears is 25 centimeters, and we know that the distance from one center of that uh, of, of one of the gears to the center of the other gear is 90 centimeters. So think about what formula would we use here. Is this an area problem or a circumference problem? Think about how you might divide this problem up into parts for which we can calculate uh, one portion of the length of this saw blade. Think about how a uh, uh, Think about how we might calculate the total length of this saw blade by cutting things up into different sections. Take some time for that. Welcome back. Well, hopefully this describes the process of divide and conquer that was similar to your approach. Um, what basically I did was that I divided it into four parts here, and the four parts can best be described. I know that one of these uh, gears is directly above my head. Imagine slicing that gear in half right down the center, in which case the portion on the right, we are wanting to measure the uh, size of the length of that chain, the saw blade, that's going around this half of a circle. Well, what's half the circumference of a circle? Well, it's one half pi times d. We are given the diameter there of 25 centimeters, and if we plug that into the formula, we get 39.27 centimeters. Now, similarly, we can go over to the other gear and do the exact same thing, slice it in half this way. In this case, it's the opposite side, the left-hand side, in which the uh, chain is, 
the, the saw blade is going around that gear, so that's another half way around the circumference of a circle. So that's really just going to be the exact same measurement as before. That's another 39.27 centimeters. And there are two portions in between it. There's a top portion here that extends 90 centimeters from the top of one gear to the top of the other gear, and we have another 90 centimeter section that um, extends from the bottom of one of the gears to the bottom of the other gear. So we have 90 centimeters to add to this total twice. And the total is 90 plus 90 plus 39.27 plus 39.27 to give us a total of 258.54 centimeters. So this is a good uh, practice for taking a look at a complex geometry and thinking to yourself, how can I divide this up into shapes for which I can define those geometries? And then combining things back together. So. Let's do one more warm-up problem here. And for this, I'm using uh, a lathe as an example. A lathe is something in which you basically uh, fixate uh, a, a large, uh, it's usually a, a, a portion of a tree, like a, um, a piece of raw wood that's been taken from, uh, from a tree stump or something. And you uh, affix it very sharply to a couple of uh, turning arms, which then turn the um, turn this large bowl of a tree um, very quickly and so that you can almost like a potter with a potter's wheel you can shape this thing down using cutting tools into things that are cylindrical symmetric sleek elegant really quite beautiful it's there's a lot of YouTube videos out there that show taking how you can take some of these really ugly things that you don't think you can create anything of any value from and you watch these professionals do this and it's really quite remarkable what they can create so the question that's being asked here is as you're using this cutting tool and you have this large tree that's coming uh, that's being rotated very quickly what is the speed by which this cutting tool is running around the surface of this tree well um, we're not given that information but we are told that it makes 75 complete revolutions in one minute and if we know how long each one of those revolutions is, then we can calculate the speed at which that material is running across the blade. If the distance around this log is one meter, then 75 revolutions per minute, there's 75 meters that's running past this blade every single minute. So the secret here is to um, find the circumference of that bowl, and so take some time to do that. And the goal here is for us to calculate not just a length, but actually a velocity.
Welcome back. Well, this one was new and exciting and different in that you were, instead of just calculating distances or areas, you were working on a velocity. But really, in this case, all you had to do was to take the revolutions per minute and multiply um, that by the distance around the bowl for each revolution. And then you're finding uh, feet per minute or meters per minute or whatever they gave us. Ah, it was inches. That's right, seven inches in diameter. So by using that diameter, we can calculate the circumference of the bowl by multiplying it by pi to get about 22 inches. Maybe you rounded it off a, a little bit differently. But I then converted it into feet by saying it was uh, 1.8326 feet. I had to divide 22 by 12 and you get something similar to that. Again, maybe you rounded things differently or you used a different value of pi. Your answer might be slightly different than this. Don't worry about it if it's close. We, th we then take that 1.8326 feet distance around the bowl and then multiply that by the revolutions per minute. 75 revolutions per minute, that's 75 1.8326 feet of those 1.8 feet, uh, feet around the bowl that are going past the blade every single uh, minute. So 1.8326 times 75 is 137 feet per minute, 137 feet that are, that's going past that cutting blade for every minute. It gives you an idea of just how quickly things are moving in the vicinity of that blade. And this is actually a pretty good introduction into uh, the second method by which we oftentimes uh, quantify the size of angles. It's something that's called a radian, and we'll get to exactly how it's defined in a moment, but more specifically, I, I want to make the point here that the way in which we define radians is to quantify angles based upon what the length of the arc is on the far side of that angle. You'll see more of that as we um, start to do some problems with this. So, once again, there are two ways in which we can uh, measure angles. One is our familiar methodology of just measuring it in degrees, and the other is our perhaps less familiar me method of measuring it in radians. Very simply here, 360 degrees around a circle, that's how big each degree is, 360 of them into the full circle. For the full circle in radians, a full circle is 2 pi radians. So what's 2 pi here? Pi is 3.14, so 2 pi would be 6.28, so about 6 and a quarter radians to make it around the full circle here. And you'll understand the significance of that a little bit more as we move on. So an angle of one radian has a very interesting property to it. I'm showing you here what looks like a piece of pi that is uh, taken out of a circle here. And you can see that I'm showing two radii, one near the bottom, one near the top, forming two different sides of that angle. Um, and the lengths of each one of those radii are listed as just r. Of course, the radius is the same regardless of where you are in the circle. But most specifically, I want you to see something. The length of that arc, and that's a little strange here, the length of that arc, you'd actually have to um, use something other than a straight ruler in order to measure that, wouldn't you? You'd have to measure it using some flexible uh, ruler material in order to measure the length of that arc. But most importantly here, I want you to know that the length of that arc, for one ra if this angle is one radian, the length of that arc is the same as the length of both of those radii. You can see here that the, the size of one radian is just a little bit less than 60 degrees. It's 57.3 degrees. It's actually a complex, uh, irrational number here that goes on forever without pattern. Um, but it's 57.3 degrees in one radian. 57.3 degrees, okay, so if we double that, we get about 114 degrees. If we take three of those, now we're into about 171 degrees, just a little bit less than 180. So three of those gets us almost to 180. Another three of those will get us almost to 360. So what's the size of this angle in radians? Well, 
take a look at those measurements there. It's a section of a pi. That angle defines the section of a pi in which the, radii, the radius really uh, is 5 inches, both in one place and in another place, of course. And the length of the arc on the opposite side of the angle there, the length of that curved arc there is given to us as 10 inches. Well, this is not, uh, so in this case, the size of the arc that's on the opposite side of the angle is not the same size as the radius. It's actually twice the size of the radius, not 5 inches, but 10 inches. This is an angle that's not one radian, it is two radians, meaning that that arc is twice the size of the radius. So, the way that we find the length, the size of an angle in radians, if we take a look at a picture like this, we take the length of that arc and we divide it by the radius, and that gives us the number of radians that define that particular angle. It seems odd that we can measure an angle using lengths of opposite arcs and things like that, but as it turns out, we can. So once again, how many how many uh, radii fit around the circle? How many uh, uh, how many radians fit around the circle is really the same question as how many radii fit around the circle. Well, we actually know this already from our formula: circumference equals two pi r. So once again, if I ask the question, how many radii go around the circle? The answer is two pi times those times the radius. Two pi of those radii go around the circle. So uh, about 6.28, which means that um, a good way to convert from one to the other is to say that 360 degrees is the same thing as 2 pi radians, or it's actually a little more simple to say 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. So think of that in terms of some conversion fractions. 180 degrees pi radians. We're going to be converting units just like we've done in previous videos. So here we go. Let's convert 55 degrees in the upper left hand corner there to radians by multiplying it by our conversion fraction. Pi radians is the same thing as 180 degrees. In this case degrees are going to be canceling giving us 0 0.96 radians. Perhaps we can do the opposite thing here in which we convert from radians back to degrees. Well, in this case we're using this, a similar conversion fraction, albeit one that is uh, flipped from the previous one here, because we want the radians to cancel this time instead of the degrees. So, three radians multiplied by 180 degrees on top and pi radians on the bottom gives us 171.9 degrees. Again, that's just a little bit less than 180 degrees. So, three radians is a little bit less than 3.14 radians, pi radians, so 171.9 degrees is a little bit less than 180 degrees. Sometimes we describe the number of radians in terms of pi, and that sounds really convoluted, but it actually makes the problems more simple because some pi's will cancel in the conversion process here. So in this case, the number of radians that I've got here for this second problem is pi over 3. Well, pi is just a little bit bigger than 3, so if we divide it by 3, that's a little bit more than 1. Okay, well. It, the number of radians is pi divided by 3. We'll just call it that. Now that sounds, again, convoluted, but let's multiply it by our conversion fraction. You can see there's 180 degrees on top and pi radians on the bottom. Aha! We can cancel those two pi's, the pi on top and the pi on the bottom. Also the units cancel for radians, and all we're left with is 180 degrees on top and that 3 on the bottom, near the, on the left-hand side there. 180 divided by 3 is 60 degrees. You'll find that when we um, convert a simple angular measure like 60 degrees or 45 degrees or 90 degrees or 120 degrees into radians, the answer will actually uh, be given in terms of pi. It will be like pi over 4 or pi over 2 or 2 pi over 3, something like that. You'll see a lot of that when we convert these simple familiar degree uh, measures into uh, equivalent radian measures.
So once again, the point behind this slide is that we have this relationship between pi radians and 180 degrees. And just like in all of our uh, explorations with unit conversion before, we can create two different conversion fractions um, depending on which direction we're going in terms of the unit conversion. So use these techniques to then uh, do some unit conversion yourself here. I've got two angle measures here that are both listed in degrees. I'd like you to convert that to radians. And in this case, you don't need to list your answer in terms of pi. You can list pi out. You can use whatever uh, measures that you want to use for pi. You can say 3.14. You can hit the pi button, 22 sevenths, a lot of different uh, means of using pi, but give your answer to the nearest hundredth of a radian, so two decimal places there. Take some time for that. Welcome back. In both cases, we are multiplying the angular measure in degrees by the appropriate conversion fraction here with degrees on the bottom, 180 degrees on bottom, and pi radians on top. And the result is that for 20 degrees, we get an equivalent measure in radians of 0.35 radians, and for 175, it's 3.05 radians. Let's also go in the other direction here. Let's convert two radians and pi over two radians to um, degrees. So, and we'll round in this case to the nearest 10,000th of a degree. So think about how many decimal places that is. Take some time for this. Welcome back. Well, in both problems, much like last time, we are multiplying them by the same conversion fraction, but unlike last time, the, it's not the degrees that are on the bottom of the conversion fraction, it's the radians now that are on the bottom of the conversion fraction. We have pi radians on the bottom, so that radians cancel out, giving us degrees, 
and so 2 radians divided by pi multiplied by 180 gives us about 114.6 degrees. And I should have rounded that to the nearest ten thousandth of a degree. I'm afraid I didn't do that. That's actually um, four decimal places, which I failed to do. So hopefully you did a better job there um, than I did. Um, for pi over 2 radians, we do the same procedure here, noticing that in this case the pi's cancel out, leaving us with just 180 degrees on top and a 2 in the denominator, resulting in a degree measure of 90 degrees. We didn't need to have any decimal places there, did we? Now let's also reach back into um, some of our uh, discussions that were in the first video on geometry, namely ones in which we described angles not in terms just of decimal degrees, but also in terms of degrees, minutes, and seconds. So as I'm giving you two measures in radians here for the size of an angle, I'd like for you to convert those not only to degrees, but into degrees, minutes, and seconds. It might take a little longer than what you were doing before. It also might require for you to uh, go back into your notes a little bit in order to review exactly how to do that. But take some time to do both of these problems. Welcome back. Well, you can see the initial uh, unit conversion here from radians into degrees. That unit conversion fraction is the same thing that we did last time here. You can see that I didn't really show my work here when it came to converting it from decimal degrees to degrees, minutes, seconds here. But let's quickly review what that procedure is here. When we get a, 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 an answer in decimal degree form, we pull off the whole number part of it. In this case, it was 57 degrees, and that's our answer for for the degree part. We then have a decimal for the remaining part here, and we multiply that decimal by 60 to find out the number of whole uh, minutes that, um, that we can then extract for the, for the second part of degrees, minutes, seconds. And in this case, we got 17 minutes. We then had a decimal trailing after that, which we then just use that decimal part multiplied by 60 to get the number of seconds. And in this case, you can see we got 
45 seconds for the first one. Similarly, the same procedure gives us 183 degrees, 20 minutes, 47 seconds for the second problem there, which makes sense. 3.2 radians, it's a little bit more than pi radians. Pi radians is the same thing as 180 degrees, so 3.2 radians should be a little bit more than 180 degrees and as you can see it is 183 degrees 20 minutes 47 seconds. Now as I've mentioned before here we can use the angle measure in radians to provide a convenient connection between the length of a radius as you can see here um, in this uh, a diagram above my head here. The length of the radius is three meters. Um, we, can, can, we can create a convenient connection between the length of that radius and the length of the arc on the opposite side of the angle here, that curved arc uh, that you can see across from that 120 degree angle. So how do we do this? Well, if we convert 120 degrees to radians, we get 2.09 radians. What that means is that the length of that arc is going to be 3 meters times 2.09. It's that simple to find the length of the arc. You take the uh, size of the angle in radians and you multiply it by the radius and you get the length of the arc. So you can see I'm doing that in the lower left hand corner here. 2.09 times 3 meters is equal to 6.27 meters. And I'm going to turn my picture off here. Example here, do this one. Find the arc length of the sector. A sector is basically a section of pi. If you were to slice a section of pi out and remove that, that's a sector. So, uh, what's the length of that arc that's on the far side of, of the sector there, formed by a 60 degree central angle if the radius of the circle is 30 millimeters? So, we have an angle that's 60 degrees, we have a radius of 30 millimeters. What's the length of that arc? Take some time to do that. Welcome back. Well, you can see this is a two-step process here. First, converting that angular measure from degrees into radians. 60 degrees is the same thing as 1.05 radians. So then we have that as our uh, uh, measure of theta, 1.05 radians. That's theta in our equation here. And so we can multiply theta times r, r being 30 millimeters, to get the length of s, which is the arc length. 30 millimeters times 1.05 radians gives us 31.5 millimeters. That's the length of that arc. Hopefully that was somewhat straightforward here. I'm going to give you a second problem of the same ilk. Let's find the arc length intercepted on the circumference of the circle. So it's another way of saying the length of that arc, that curvature arc there, by um, uh, a, a um, 
a central angle of pi over 3 radians. Now we've already done the conversion, haven't we, from degrees into radians. You don't have to do that conversion there. So we know that that angle is pi over 3 radians there, and we know the radius is 10 centimeters. So find the length of that arc based upon that information. Welcome back. Well, as I said before, this, there's no need to do any unit conversion in this problem. We already have our angle measure not in degrees, but in our desired radians, pi over 3 radians, so that we can immediately multiply theta by r. 10 centimeters is r, pi over 3 radians is theta, for an answer of 10.5 centimeters. Hopefully that was a, a quick problem for you to do. Let's actually uh, do something slightly different here. Let's turn it the other way. I'm giving you uh, a sector of a circle in which the length of the far arc there, the length of the arc is 12.5 meters. That's the arc length. And I'm giving you the radius there of 5 meters. So I'm asking you to calculate the size of that angle there. And the size of the angle uh, will be measured in radians. Take some time to do that. Welcome back. Well, we're using our same formula from before, but we're using it, albeit, in a slightly different fashion. Our formula from before is s is equal to r theta. In this case, we're not trying to find the length of the arc, s. We're trying to find the size of the angle, theta. So we have to get theta by itself by dividing both sides by r. That gets theta by itself, and we have theta is equal to s divided by r, the length of the arc length divided by the length of the radius. So the length of the arc is 12.5 meters. The length of the radius is 5 meters. If we divide those things out, we get 2.5. Two 2.5 and two and what? Ah, yes, this is 2.5 radians, once again. Radians are kind of a, they don't really have a unit, do they? You can see all the units canceled out there. We just have 2.5. 2.5 is, in this case, radians. So we've used this formula to um, calculate the arc length, given the 
angle and the radius. This is S equals R theta. We've used that to calculate the arc length if we're given the radius and the angle size. In the last problem, we used the same formula to calculate the angle given the radius and the arc length. Now we can also use the same formula to calculate the radius given the arc length and the angle. This is a good reminder that all of these formulas are really a relationship between three different quantities, a dance between three different things. And if you know any of the two, you can always find the third. Always, always, always. In this case, we are finding the size of the radius, but we'll pull up the same um, I just gave you the answer there. So uh, we'll pull up the same formula there, uh, but we'll use it slightly differently. In this case, we're solving for the, for the radius r. So take some time to do that. Welcome back. Well, you can see from what I've shown here, or perhaps you didn't need for me to show this here since I quickly gave it away by accident earlier on, that we can use the same formula here to solve for the size of the radius. In this case, we're using our same formula, but we want to get r by itself, so we divide both sides by theta. That gets r by itself, and on the opposite side of the equation, we have s divided by theta. We know s as being 8.22.